live from Atlanta, Georgia, it's theCUBE, covering Ansible Fest 2019. Brought to you by Red Hat. Welcome back everyone, live CUBE coverage here in Atlanta. This is theCUBE's coverage of Ansible Fest. This is Red Hat, Ansible's two days of live coverage. They had a contributor day yesterday before the conference, all being covered by theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Stu Miniman. Our next guest is Chris Gardner, Hello. Principal Analyst at Forrester. Gardner, welcome to theCUBE. Thank Good to you. See you. Good to talk to you. Hey, analyzing the players in this space is really challenging. You've got a new wave that came out a few months ago. Yep. Laying it all out, um, certainly the world changed. You go back eight years, cloud was just hitting the scene. On premises looked good, data center was rocking. You're doing <laughs> network management, you're doing some configuration management. Now you got observability, you yeah, got automation. Yeah, absolutely. The world's changing big yeah. time. What's your take? What's the assessment? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because the prior versions of that wave focused entirely on configuration management. And the feedback I got was um, the world's a lot bigger than that, right? And we have to talk about platforms. And you heard it this morning during the keynote about. Red Hat moving towards an Ansible platform, an automation platform, and my definition of a platform is things like configuration management, hybrid cloud management, all the various types of automation and orchestration need to be there, but you also need compliance, you need governance, you need the ability to hopefully make a call as to what is actually occurring and have some intelligence behind the automation. And obviously you need the integrations. It's not a situation to simply have as many people as possible, although that's nice, as many vendors you work with, but to have real relationships. If you have Microsoft working on automation code with you, if you have Amazon working on automation code with you, that makes a true platform. Well, it, it, right, it's, John said earlier today, a platform needs to be an enabler, and we've even said if you can't build on top of this, Correct. which like the collections uh, that Ansible announced here, seems like it might fit under that definition. Yeah, and, and there's an old joke that everything becomes a platform eventually, right? Um, but I think, I think it, it bears, it, it, there's, there's some merit in this one. Um, the other thing is that I'm seeing a lot of folks want a holistic automation solution. Yeah. And the only way you're going to do that is to have a platform that you can build things on top of it and connect the pieces and provide the proper governance. So um, I'm mostly in agreement with the definition that's been described here. And I think yeah. you could tackle it different ways. Uh, and all the vendors in the space are certainly doing that. Definitely platform thinking is different. Um, you know, the easy way to look at it in the old big data space too, when we used to cover that, was a tool versus a platform. You know, tools, the hammer, everything looks like a nail. Did great things, one thing great, or a few things good. Platform is more of a systems thinking. Yes, it's, it's, yeah. And you got glue layers, you got data, so it's really more of that systems thinking. That separates the winners from the losers, at least in our opinion. Yeah, sure abso agree. absolutely. I mean, when you looked at who, who was the leaders in my wave, it wasn't on the basics of automating or orchestration and configuration management. They all had that. The, th the, the ones that were winners were, can I do compliance in a different way? Can I actually have people come into the system that aren't IT people and make a call on some of these things? Can I apply AI and machine learning to some of this? Can I make some recommendations and hopefully direct people in the right, you know, the, where they should go? And you know the folks that were able to do that rose to the top. The folks that weren't were average and below. Yeah, Chris, bring us inside to some of the competitive dynamics here. We understand you know there's a lot of open source here, and therefore everybody holds hands and sings kumbaya. But you know there's you know product tools, there's the public yeah. clouds and what they do, and then you know Ansible, uh, you know fits in a lot of different places. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's a bit ironic because uh, you know this is one of those waves where and it's very rare that everyone was 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 at least preaching kumbaya. <laughs> they were all saying that they were friendly with one another, and, and uh, quite frankly, I, I tend to believe it. We're in a situation right now where you can't get by, especially in a hybrid cloud world where you're going to have resources that live in multiple, you know, AWS and Azure, but also on premises and at the edge. You need to have these integrations. You need to be able to talk to one another. So, um, that said, there's certainly a lot of co-opetition going on where people are saying, if I can integrate these tools better, if I can provide a better governance layer, if I can, again, hand things off to the enterprise in a way that has not been handed off before, that I don't even go through an INO group, an infrastructure and operations group, those are going to be the ones that truly succeed in this space. Software-defined data center, software-defined cloud, everything's software-defined. Yeah. These abstraction layers, data and software, we had a guest on theCUBE uh, a week ago saying, data's the new software. Well, I get, okay, it's nice, nice like, gimmick, but if you think about it, this abstraction layer is like a control plane. Everyone wants to go for these control planes, yeah. uh, um, which is a feature of a platform. As this automation platform becomes ultimately the AI platform, 
how do you see it evolving and expanding? Because you see organic growth, you see certainly key position, yeah. six million stars on GitHub. I mean, it's running the plumbing. I mean, come on, like it's, not, it's not like it's just some corner case. Yeah, it's yeah. It's core infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, you know, in an idealistic way, I'd like to see we, us resolve on singular holistic platforms for enterprises. The reality is that's not, not the way you can do it today. What I do try to help clients do is at least rationalize their portfolio. If they have 12 different automation products they're running, chances are that's not the best idea. Um, I've actually had situations where someone will say to me, um, I'm running Ansible in one portion of my organization and Chef in another, and I say, well, it's some, they do similar things. And the reason for it was because they were stood up organically. Each yeah. group kind of figured out things along the way, and I have to at least guide them and say, you know, where are the similarities, where can you potentially you know, remove some stuff from the equation? It's like the cloud discussion, you know, we always debate upon you know, multi-cloud, sole cloud. Ultimately, the workload needs something underneath, and I think workload definition dictates yeah kind of what might be underneath, so it might be okay to have a couple you know, automation platforms, or it could be great to have one. Yeah. I mean, this is really I, the eye of the beholder, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, yeah, right? Yeah, in my, my view, I'm, I, I've been an analyst for a couple of years, before that I was doing this stuff for a living, I have the war scars, and in my view, it's, it's not even a matter of how many tools you use, it's putting the workload where it belongs, that matters, and if you could do that with fewer tools, obviously that from an operational level, that makes life a lot easier. Um, but I'm not going to say to somebody, you know, completely dismantle your entire automation and orchestration <laughs> workflow just because I think this one tool is better. Let's talk about how we can. That's the worst case this. scenario because exactly. if you have to dictate workloads based on what tool you have, that's supposed to be the other way around, right? Yes. Setting up a nuclear bomb in the data center or in the cloud has never worked. <laughs> <laughs> Note to self: Don't do that. Yes. Chris, one of the interesting conversations we've already been having here at this show is that the tool is actually helping to drive some of the cultural change oh, yeah. and collaboration. So, you know, what are you finding in your research? How is that, you know, kind of the sysadmin role and, you know, to the yeah, cloud I, in applications You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I, we continue to beat the drum that these folks are becoming developers, but we've been beating that drum for a decade now, and I, quite frankly, we got to continue to beat it. But what I think is more, even more interesting is we have groups starting to, to pop up in our research that are separate from IT, that focus on automation in a way that no one has done before. Some, we, we went into it saying, oh, that's a center of excellence, right? And the teams that we talked to said, no, do not call us a center of excellence. <laughs> uh, two reasons, one is that term is tainted. Uh, but secondly, we're not one team, there's multiple automation teams. So we're actually starting to call these groups strike teams that come in and standardize and say, okay, I have a lead architect, a lead robot architect. Say it's around infrastructure automation. I'm going to standardize across the board and when other groups need to come on board, I have the principles already laid out, I have the, the process already laid out. I come in, I accelerate that, I set it up, and then I back off. I don't own the process and I'm not part of IT either. IT's got operations of its own that's got to worry about. I'm in between the two. And when we talk to, especially the Fortune 100, they are setting these groups up. Now when I ask them, what do you call them, they don't have a name yet. So I think strike teams sound sexy, but um, ultimately this is not like a, 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 a section of IT that's been se severed off and becomes this role. It's a completely strike new Strike team's better than committee. Uh, yeah. I mean, committee or, sounds like, you know, or, yeah, waterfall, it, slow process. Exactly, you know, gridlock. exactly. And it better fits what the role is. The role is to come in, nail the process, get it automated, and then get out. It's not to stand there and be a standards body forever. Um, there's certainly some groups that, in some types of automation, like RPA, where you want them to stick around because you may want them to manage the bots. There's a whole role called bot masters, which is specifically for that role. But most of the time, you want them to be part of that process and then you know, hand it back off. Yeah, we've seen some interesting patterns. I want to get your thoughts on this. It's a little bit of a non sequitur, but I want to bring it in. But in the security space, you're seeing CISOs chief information security officers, building their own stacks internally. Absolutely. They're picking one cloud, Amazon or Azure, and they're building all in, maybe some hedge with some people working on some backup cloud, but they don't want to fork their talent. Right. They want them all on one cloud, and because they, they need to be badass, responsive, strike teams for security pressure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can, it's not as critical with the security side with automation, but certainly relevance. Is that same thing going on here with this development drum that's being continued to beat, is much more around core competency and building internally stacks and building some standards? I, I, I think it is, and you know, what's interesting too is that I work with, I'm on the infrastructure and operations team at Forrester, I talk with INO people all day long, but I work alongside the security team, and I said to them a couple years ago, 
Um, you guys are going to have to get your hands dirty with the stuff that I cover. You guys have to know infrastructure automation APIs, you need to know how to code these things. And I said, are you comfortable telling your SecOps folks, your clients that? They go, no, by all means. They have to be part of this. No, they're okay with them talking to me, or Talk, connecting. Talking to them and saying that you need to be part of the infrastructure design process and need to be part of this decision making process, right? Um, which is different than their SecOps role used to be. So my point is, is that these worlds are not that dissimilar as some people might think they are. Sec DevOps or whatever we're going to call it, we keep tacking letters onto this thing, um, is an actual discipline and it is a reality in most organizations I talk to that people should be targeting. So a system has all these things, has data across the system, yep. depending on what subsystem you're talking about. I yep. mean, it's a holistic system. Security and data. Yeah, and we're in a world now, especially around things like edge computing, where data gravity matters. So all these pieces, you know, it's, if you, if you go back to the old school kind of computer science folks from the you know, 50s, 60s, and 70s, they're like, this is not new. We've been thinking systems thinking for a while, but I think we're finally at a place where we're actually now breaking down the silos that we've been championing to do so for So years. I got to ask you the analyst question since you're watching the landscape, yeah. Stu, and Stu wants to jump in, but I want to get this out. So observability became a category yep. at a network management. I mean, network management was like this boring, kind of plodding along, <laughs> white space. I mean, super important. People need to do yeah, network yeah. management. And then in comes the cloud, it becomes a data problem, whether it's observability, you got microservices, you got security, signal FX, all these companies going public, um, a lot of M&A activities, basically large segment, a lot of frothiness. Automation feels like it's growing to be big. Yes. Is there startup opportunities here? If, if platforms are becoming being a combination of things, is there room for startups? And if so, what would you say um, those stars would look like? I, I think there are. I think what we're seeing is, and it, it speaks to the observer, observ, uh, the word you just said. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, can, I, can, I know what it is, but I can't say it. Um, we're seeing the APM vendors move down the stack. We're seeing the infrastructure monitoring vendors move up the stack. And in the middle, we're seeing them both try to automate the same things. Um, you cannot pull off some of the infrastructure as code automation that we need to pull off without observability but you can't get that observability unless you're able to pull it from the top of the stack. Um, what we're going to see is consolidation, and we're already starting to see it, um, where you're going to have different groups come together and say, why have two tools to do this? Why not do one? Um, the reason why you do multiple tools today is because no one is truly strong at the entire stack. Uh, a lot of the folks that are going down the stack say that they're not quite infrastructure automation players just yet, but watch the space, they will be eventually. So there's change happening. Big time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And startups getting funded, you think there's opportunity to take some I territory think there is, down? If, if there's any opportunity, and, and I'm, I'm pushing for this, it's in the AI, AI ops space when it comes to these things, is actually going beyond where we stand today. So I want to be clear that um, AI ops is, is a great concept. The reality of it is that we're still a ways away from it being practical. I'd like to see not just recommendations from these tools that the startups are come providing, but actually trust in them to make the changes necessary. So Chris, it sounds like the Ansible Automation platform announcement today fits with what you've been saying for the last couple of years. So yeah, I, yeah. I guess the, the, the question is, what, what's next? Where does Ansible need to mature and expand, and you know, what, what are users asking for that Ansible's not doing today? Yeah, you know, so a couple things. Um, they did okay, but not fantastic at infrastructure modeling, Ansible. They did okay, but not um, amazing at what we call comprehension, which is making a call as to, you know, using AI and machine learning to make a call on what the infrastructure layer should look like. To be frank, no one did really well on that one. So, not too, not too bad on that. Um, and the other thing is they need to improve slightly is their integration story. They actually have a really good one. You see all the folks that are here. Um, it's, just, it's, it's just a hair away from being the best. They're not quite there yet. So, and when, again, when I mean integrations, I don't mean having a laundry list of vendors you work with. I mean actually working with them to build code. And you saw that this morning. Where Who's the best? Uh, right now, surprisingly, is VMware. But VMware's built that relationship up for a long time. Um, they work right alongside Microsoft and Google and all these folks to build the code together. Who's the dark horse in the industry? Uh, <laughs> I think the darkest source of all is, is probably, and it remains to be seen if they can actually do something, is, is HashiCorp. Um, Terraform is an interesting player in this entire space. I actually included them in our wave on infrastructure automation platforms, and you can argue, is it even an automation platform? Quite frankly, um, 
uh, I think HashiCorp itself is trying to figure out exactly what <laughs> it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. But the bottom line is it's got tremendous mind share and it works well. So I think that if you watch, if you see their strategy going forward and look at you know, what they're putting their investments into, they could become a really serious damaging player in the space. Chris Gardner, thanks for coming on theCUBE, yeah, sharing your you. insights and your research at Forrester. Uh, Forrester Wave, check it out. Just came out a couple months ago. Uh, infrastructure Automation Platforms Q3 2019. Chris Gardner, the author, here on theCUBE, breaking it down. I'm John Furrier with Stu Miniman. We'll be back with more after this short break. Thank you.